Hello and welcome back to part four of this Antichrist series. In the three previous videos, we've seen how the prophets Daniel, Micah, and Isaiah have pointed to a Middle Eastern Antichrist government that would rule just before the second coming of Christ. In the next few videos, we'll be taking a look at the prophet Ezekiel and how he also pointed us to a Middle Eastern end times Antichrist world power. I think it is best to get a clear picture of what the prophet Ezekiel was going through before we start to discuss the chapters regarding the Antichrist in uh, chapters 38 and 39 of Ezekiel. A little context on the book of Ezekiel. In the Old Testament, the name of God Yahweh occurs 6,519 times. In the book of Ezekiel alone, the name Yahweh occurs over 214 times. Thanks to the superstition of the Jews, many Bible translations today have removed the divine name completely. The Hebrew name Ezekiel means, May God Strengthen. Ezekiel certainly needed the strength of God for the mission God gave him. In 605 BCE, the first siege of Jerusalem, as described in 2 Kings, the 24th chapter, Ezekiel was about 18 years old. It was at this time when 15-year-old Daniel and his three friends were captured by Nebuchadnezzar and taken to Babylon. However, Ezekiel was left behind in Jerusalem. At age 30, he would be eligible for the priesthood, but before he reached that age, he was taken into exile in the next invasion of Jerusalem, which occurred in the year 597 BCE. This was the second siege of Jerusalem and exile to Babylon. Besides Ezekiel, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon took King Jehoiachin into exile to Babylon along with 10,000 Jews. The year 593 BCE was the year Ezekiel began his prophetic ministry, which would span two decades ending around 573 BCE. Ezekiel is prophesying from exile to the Jews in exile before the final destruction of Jerusalem, which occurred in the year 586 BCE, when Jerusalem was captured and the temple and the city walls were destroyed. Ezekiel would see visions of another temple and another Jerusalem, a city that would be known by the glorious name Jehovah Shammah, or Yahweh, is there. You find that in Ezekiel 48, verse 35. That's a clear reference to the Messianic kingdom. The book of Ezekiel chapters 1 through 11 are God's accusations against the nation of Israel. Ezekiel had been in Babylonian captivity for five years on his 30th birthday, and he is sitting by a river when he has a vision given to him by God. In this vision, Ezekiel sees storm clouds, and inside the clouds he sees four strange creatures with outstretched wings touching each other. Ezekiel describes them as four living creatures that had human form. Ezekiel chapter 1 verse 6 it says, But each one had four faces, each one had four wings. In verse 10, As for the form of their faces, they had the face of a man in front, and the four of them had the face of a lion on the right side, and the four of them had the face of an ox on the left side. The four of them also had the face of an eagle. So he sees these interesting creatures here. Down in verse 13 it says, For the form of the living creatures, their appearance was like burning coals of fire, like the appearance of torches. The fire moved back and forth between the living creatures, and the fire was bright. And out of the fire went forth lightning. The living creatures moved backward and forward as quickly as flashes of lightning. Now as I looked at the living creatures, I saw one wheel on the ground beside the living creatures, one wheel for each of the four of them. The appearance of the wheels and their construction was like the gleam of beryl. Beryl is a mineral. It is frequently tinted by impurities, which makes colors vary between green, blue, emerald, aquamarine, yellow, and red. Anyway, it says, And the four of them had the same form, and their appearance and their construction was as if one wheel was inside another wheel. When they moved, they went in their four directions. They did not turn when they went. As for their rims, they were high and awe-inspiring, and the four of them had their rims full of eyes all around. Verse 22, Over the head of the living creatures there was something like a platform, glittering awesomely like crystal that was spread out over their heads above them. 
and under the platform their wings were stretched out straight toward one another. Each one also had two wings covering its body on the one side and on the other. When they went, I heard the sound of their wings, like the sound of great waters, like the voice of the Almighty, the sound of commotion, like the sound of an army. Whenever they stopped, they let down their wings. Above the platform that was over their heads was the form of a throne, as the appearance of a sapphire stone, and on the form of the throne high up was a form like the form of a man. And I saw from the appearance of his waist and upward what looked like gleaming amber with the appearance of fire, enclosing it all around. And from the appearance of his waist and downward I saw what looked like fire, and there was brightness all around him. Verse 28 says, Like the appearance of the rainbow that is in the cloud in the day of rain, so was the appearance of the brightness all around him. This was the appearance of the form of the glory of Yahweh. When I saw it, I fell on my face, and I heard a voice of one that spoke. So this chariot that Ezekiel saw was a representation of God's glory. God commissions Ezekiel as a prophet here as he begins to accuse the nation of Israel for her many sins against God and for breaking their covenant with God. Ezekiel foretells that Jerusalem will again be invaded by the Babylonians, which occurred in the year 586 BCE. God forewarned Ezekiel that no one would listen to his preaching efforts. In his next vision from God, Ezekiel is shown the temple and how the Jewish elders are worshipping false gods inside the temple itself. He is also shown Jewish women inside the temple area, worshipping a statue of the Babylonian false god Tammuz. The vision ends with God's glorious throne chariot leaving up and going away from the temple. Because the Jews' flagrant idolatry and their covenant relations had become so bad, God here is showing Ezekiel that he has left his temple in Jerusalem. Chapters 12 through 24 of Ezekiel are God's judgments against the nation of Israel. In these chapters, Yahweh has lost patience with his people and sentences the nation to be destroyed because of their obscene idolatry. He foretells their destruction by the Babylonians. In chapters 25 through 32, these are God's judgments against the nations. Even though God used the nations to punish his people at times, God still held the surrounding nations accountable for causing harm to his people. In Ezekiel chapter 25, God tells Ezekiel that he will punish those nations who fought against his people and punish them. Yahweh speaks judgments against the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Edomites, the Philistines, and the city of Tyre. Ezekiel 25.2, it says, Son of man, set your face towards the children of Ammon and prophesy against them. The Ammonites were descendants of Lot's younger daughter, and they were always rivals with the people of God. Down in verse 6, it says, For this is what the Lord Yahweh says, Because you have clapped your hands and stamped with the feet and rejoiced with all the contempt in your soul against the land of Israel, therefore, behold, I have stretched out my hand on you and will deliver you for a spoil to the nations. And I will cut you off from the peoples and I will cause you to perish out of the countries. I will destroy you and you will know that I am Yahweh. Next, God speaks against the Moabite people. The Moabites were descendants of Lot's older daughter, and they were also enemies with the Jews. Verse 8 says, This is what the Lord Yahweh says, Because Moab and Seir say, Behold, the house of Judah is like all the nations. Therefore, behold, I will open the side of Moab from the cities, from his cities that are on his frontiers, to the children of the east, to go against the children of Ammon, and I will give them for a possession, that the children of Ammon may not be remembered among the nations. And I will execute judgments on Moab, and they will know that I am Yahweh. After that, Yahweh judges the Edomites. The Edomites were descendants of Esau, and they were also the enemies of God's people. Verse 12 It says, This is what the Lord Yahweh says, Because Edom has dealt against the house of Judah by taking vengeance and has incurred grievous guilt and avenged himself on them, therefore this is what the Lord Yahweh says, I will stretch out my hand on Edom and I will cut off man and animal from it, and I will make it desolate from Teman even to Dedan. They will fall by the sword. 
I will lay my vengeance on Edom by the hand of my people Israel. And they will do in Edom according to my anger and according to my wrath. And they will know my vengeance, says the Lord Yahweh. Then God judges the Philistine people for the mistreatment of his people. The Philistines were an aggressive, warmongering, seafaring people who occupied territory southwest of Israel between the Mediterranean Sea and the Jordan River. The name Philistine comes from the Hebrew word Philistia and the Greek rendering of the name Palestinae gives us the modern name Palestine. With their more advanced armaments and aggressive military policy, the Philistines continually thwarted Israel's development as a nation. For nearly 200 years, the Philistines harassed and oppressed the Israelites, often invading Israel's territory. In Ezekiel chapter 25, Yahweh speaks against the Philistines. In verse 15, it says, This is what the Lord Yahweh says. Because the Philistines have dealt by revenge and have taken vengeance with despite of soul to destroy with perpetual enmity, therefore this is what the Lord Yahweh says, Behold, I will stretch out my hand on the Philistines, and I will cut off the Cherethites and destroy the remnant of the seacoast. I will execute great vengeance on them with wrathful rebukes, and they will know that I am Yahweh when I lay my vengeance on them. Finally, in Ezekiel chapter 26, Yahweh speaks judgments against the city of Tyre. The city of Tyre was a famous Phoenician seaport located 20 miles south of Sidon on the Mediterranean coast. During the time of the prophet Joel, the Phoenicians sold Jewish children as slaves to the Greeks. Yahweh promised retribution against them for doing this. The channel between Tyre and the mainland was over 20 feet deep and frequently lashed by violent southwest winds. Tyre was one half mile or so from the mainland. Their fortifications, they believed, would resist the strongest of assaults from any possible invaders, and the city walls stood at 150 feet above the sea. The people of Tyre became overly confident in their natural island defenses and overly proud of the wealth and beauty of their city. They developed a feeling of jealousy and rivalry toward Jerusalem and exulted over the misfortunes she faced and hoped to exploit them for commercial opportunity. For these reasons, the prophet Ezekiel was inspired to prophesy against her. In Ezekiel chapter 26, God makes judgments against Tyre. Ezekiel 26, 1, it came to pass in the eleventh year, in the first day of the month, that the word of Yahweh came to me, saying, Son of man, because Tyre has said against Jerusalem, Aha, she is broken, the gate of the people, she is turned to me. I will be replenished now that she is laid waste. Therefore, this is what the Lord Yahweh says, Behold, I am against you, Tyre, and will cause many nations to come up against you, as the sea causes its waves to come up. They will destroy the walls of Tyre and break down her towers. I will also scrape her dust from her and make her a bare rock. She will be a place for the spreading of nets in the middle of the sea, for I have spoken it, says the Lord Yahweh, and she will become a spoil to the nations. Her daughters who are in the field will be slain with the sword, and they will know that I am Yahweh. Here God foretells Tyre's destruction. Nebuchadnezzar's siege of Tyre began not long after Ezekiel's words against the city. According to the first century Jewish historian Josephus, Nebuchadnezzar lays siege to Tyre for an incredible 13 years. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, conquered the mainland city of Tyre and slaughtered its inhabitants but was unable to attack the city offshore with conventional methods, such as using battering rams or siege engines, since Tyre was an island city. So he ordered his soldiers to gather great rocks and build a causeway from the mainland to the walls of the island. After 13 years of siege from 586 to 573 BCE, the Tyrians negotiated a surrender with the Babylonians. Yet the prophecy concerning Tyre at this point could only be said to be partly fulfilled. Nebuchadnezzar had taken the mainland city, but the island city had not been destroyed, let alone thrown into the water. The fulfillment of this part of the prophecy would wait over 250 years for the ascent of Alexander the Great. 
Remember, Ezekiel had said that Tyre would be plundered by many nations. Alexander the Great was tempted to bypass the island fortress and to continue his march towards Egypt. He sent messengers to Tyre, urging them to accept a peace treaty. Believing themselves to be safe on their island, the Tyrians killed Alexander's ambassadors and threw their bodies from the top of the walls into the sea. This act served only to anger Alexander and embitter his troops. Alexander determined to build a causeway to get his troops from the mainland to the island. The causeway is said to have been at least 200 feet wide. It was constructed from stones and timber from the old city of Tyre on the mainland. In fulfillment of Ezekiel's prophecy, the very foundation stones, timbers, and dust of the city was cast in the midst of the sea. That's uh, found at Ezekiel 26, verse 12. Alexander was able to obtain ships from Sidon, Greek allies, and Cyprus to form a blockade around Tyre. When Alexander's causeway was within artillery range of Tyre, Alexander brought up stone throwers and light catapults, reinforced by archers and slingers for a saturation barrage. Battle engineers constructed several naval battering rams which smashed through the walls of Tyre. Though courageous, the Tyrians were no match for Alexander's troops. Over 7,000 Tyrians died in the defense of their island. In contrast, only 400 Macedonians were killed. So all of the words of Yahweh in Ezekiel regarding Tyre and all the other nations mentioned in Ezekiel came to fulfillment just as Yahweh said. As you can clearly see, the Bible is an amazing book of history showing God's dealings with the people of the nations, in this case the nations of Ammon, Moab, Edom, the Philistine, and the city of Tyre. Continuing on in Ezekiel chapters 34 through 48, speak of the future hope for Israel. In Ezekiel chapter 34, Yahweh likens his people to sheep who will no longer suffer at the hands of the nations. Like the other prophets, Ezekiel talks about the condition of God's people in the Messianic kingdom. Ezekiel 34, 5, it says, I will make with them a covenant of peace. And I will cause evil animals to cease out of the land, and they may dwell securely in the wilderness and sleep in the woods. Down uh, to verse 26, it says, I'll make them in the places around my hill, referring to Jerusalem, a blessing. I will cause the shower to come down in its season. There will be showers of blessing. The tree of the field will yield its fruit, and the earth will yield its increase, and they will be secure in their land. And they will know that I am Yahweh when I have broken the bars of their yoke and have delivered them out of the hand of those who made slaves of them. They will no more be prey to the nations, nor will the animals of the earth devour them, but they will dwell securely and nothing will make them afraid. I will raise up to them a plantation for renown, for they will be no more consumed with famine in the land, nor bear the shame of the nations any more. They will know that I, Yahweh, their God, am with them, and that they, the house of Israel, are my people, says the Lord Yahweh. You are my sheep, the sheep of my pasture, are human beings, and I am your God, says the Lord Yahweh. Ezekiel chapter 36, again foretelling the Messianic kingdom. In verse 24 it says, For I will take you from among the nations and gather you out of all the countries and will bring you into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. I will also give you a new heart, and I will put a new spirit inside you, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit inside you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will keep my ordinances and do them. You will live in the land that I gave to your fathers, and you will be my people, and I will be your God. I will save you from all your uncleanness, and I will call for the grain, and will multiply it, and lay no famine on you. I will multiply the fruit of the tree and the increase of the field, that you may receive no more the reproach of famine among the nations. So obviously these verses here are speaking of the restored nation and the kingdom of God. Ezekiel chapter 37 continues with this message of restoration of his people. 
Ezekiel's vision of the valley of dry bones in Ezekiel 37, 1 through 14, came to him after God had directed him to prophesy the rebirth of Israel in chapter 36. It says, uh, The hand of Yahweh was on me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of Yahweh and set me down in the middle of the valley, and it was full of bones. He caused me to pass among them all around, and behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley, and behold, they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord Yahweh, you know. Then he said to me, Prophesy over these bones and tell them, O dry bones, hear the word of Yahweh. This is what the Lord Yahweh says to these bones. Behold, I will cause a spirit to enter into you, and you will live. I will put sinews on you, and will bring up flesh on you, and cover you with skin, and put spirit in you, and you will live, and you will know that I am Yahweh. Verse 7. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a noise, and behold, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. And I looked, and behold, there were sinews on them, and flesh grew upon them, and skin covered over them, but there was no spirit in them. Then he said to me, Prophesy to the Spirit, prophesy, son of man, and tell the Spirit, this is what the Lord Yahweh says. Come from the four winds, O Spirit, and breathe on these slain, so that they come to life. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the Spirit came into them, and they came to life, and stood up on their feet, an exceedingly great army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried up, and our hope is lost. We are cut off completely. Therefore prophesy and tell them, this is what the Lord Yahweh says. Behold, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves, O my people, and I will bring you into the land of Israel. You will know that I am Yahweh when I have opened your graves and caused you to come up out of your graves, O my people. I will put my spirit in you and you will live and I will place you in your own land. Then you will know that I, Yahweh, have spoken it and done it, says Yahweh. Here in Ezekiel chapter 37, God announced to the prophet Ezekiel that Israel will be restored to her land in blessing under the leadership of David my servant, who shall be king over them, a clear reference to the future under Jesus Christ the Messiah in the millennial kingdom. However, this promise seemed impossible in the light of Israel's present condition. She was dead as a nation, deprived of her land, her king, and her temple. She had been divided and dispersed for so long that unification and restoration seemed impossible. Remember that the Jews were still captive to Babylon at this point, with no hope of ever having their city restored. So God gave Ezekiel the vision of the dry bones as a sign. God transported Ezekiel not literally but in a vision to a valley full of dry bones and directed him to speak to the bones. Ezekiel was to tell the bones that God would make breath enter the bones and they would come to life just as in the creation of man when he breathed life into Adam in the Genesis account. Ezekiel obeyed, the bones came together, flesh developed, skin covered the flesh, breath entered the bodies and they stood up in a vast army. This vision symbolized the whole house of Israel that was then in captivity. Like unburied skeletons, the people were in a state of living death, pining away with no end to their judgment and sight. They thought their hope was gone, and they were cut off forever. The surviving Israelites felt their national hopes had been dashed, and the nation had died in the flames of Babylon's attack, with no hope of resurrection. The reviving of the dry bones signified God's plan for Israel's future national restoration. This vision also, and most importantly, showed that Israel's new life depended on God's power and not the circumstances of the people. Putting breath by God's Spirit into the bones showed that God would not only restore them physically, but also spiritually. The Israelites residing in the Holy Land today since 1948 is not the fulfillment of this prophecy. It will be fulfilled when God regathers believing Israelites to the land and Christ returns to establish his millennial kingdom. In Ezekiel 37, the following verses 15 through 28 continues on with the metaphor of two sticks, which refers to the two houses of Jerusalem, the southern kingdom of Judah and the northern kingdom of Samaria. 
which builds on the vision of Ezekiel 37, verses 1 through 14. God promised to not only return Israel to the land, but also to reunify the kingdoms of northern and southern Judah, which were split in the year 931 BCE. God promises to make them one nation with one king. However, this reunification never literally happened, which suggests that it finds a broader fulfillment in the new covenant with the coming of Christ, where the new covenant is made with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. The two kingdoms of Israel find unification in Christ who made disciples of all nations. This would include the scattered people of northern Israel who never returned from the Assyrian exile in the year 722 BCE. The Spirit unified these people in Christ at Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. This is made clear in Acts 2 verse 5 where it says, Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. Furthermore, Ezekiel 37 speaks of David being king over Israel, a reference to Christ who comes from the Davidic line. The vision of resurrection in Ezekiel is thus followed by an expansive metaphor that finds fulfillment in the new covenant. Therefore, Ezekiel chapter 37 links to the new covenant to suggest that the metaphor of the resurrection also foreshadows a future bodily resurrection of the people of God. The prophet Daniel also spoke of a future bodily resurrection of the dead in Daniel 12, verses 2 through 3, where it says, And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. And those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky above, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. So bodily resurrection is the glorious hope the Christian life, and it is gloriously tucked away throughout the Old and New Testaments. God continues on with his message of hope and comfort in uh, Ezekiel chapter 37 and verse 25 there. It says, They will live in the land that I have given to Jacob, my servant, in which your fathers lived, and they will live in it, they and their children and their children's children forever, and David, my servant, will be their prince forever. And I will cut a covenant of peace with them. It will be an everlasting covenant with them. I will place with them and multiply them and will set my sanctuary in their midst forever. And my dwelling place will be with them. and I will be their God and they will be my people. The nations will know that I am Yahweh who sanctifies Israel when my sanctuary is in their midst forever. Okay, here is where we come to the prophecy about Gog of Magog in the next two chapters of Ezekiel in chapters 38-39. I will be discussing these two chapters and how they discuss the Antichrist and his armies now that we have a greater understanding of the context of the book of Ezekiel. Then the last nine chapters of Ezekiel 40-48 through speak about the future kingdom of God and details about the future messianic temple and how God's glory once again returns to this temple. It ends with a strong message of hope for a total restoration of Israel and all mankind through God's eternal kingdom. Like many of the other prophets in the Bible, Ezekiel ends with the focus being on the kingdom of God as the final solution for all mankind. The setting for Ezekiel chapters 38 and 39 that I will focus on next is a picture of the final evil invader of Israel just before the return of Christ. One of the most frequently discussed and highly debated passages of biblical prophecy is Ezekiel chapters 38 and 39, which is most often referred to as the Battle of Gog of Magog. This passage describes an evil last days leader called Gog and his massive coalition of nations who together invade the land of Israel only to be supernaturally decimated by God and Christ just before the Battle of Armageddon. I will show in this video that Gog is the Antichrist and the nations of Gog's alliance will be among the primary followers of the Antichrist. The Antichrist has many names in the Bible, and Gog is just another one of his names. Some of the titles of the Antichrist are the Man of Sin or the Man of Lawlessness, the Prince that shall come in Daniel chapter 9, symbols for the Antichrist are the Beast of Revelation 13, the Seventh Head of the Scarlet Beast in Revelation 17, 
and the Little Horn of Daniel, chapters 7 and 8. Types of the Antichrist include King Nebuchadnezzar, King of Babylon, the King of the North in Daniel chapter 11, the Prince of Tyre, and Gog of the land of Magog, which we'll be discussing. Other types of the Antichrist include Satan, Abaddon, Apollyon, and Revelation chapter 9. So the Antichrist is known by many different names. I will show that the invasion of Ezekiel 38 and 39 is simply one more retelling of the same story that all of the prophets tell. While numerous additional details could be added, this basic story is summarized as follows. 1. A group of nations led by Gog, the Antichrist, attack Israel and persecute Christians globally. 2. As a result, over a period of three and a half years, the nation of Israel experiences one final utter devastation, with many being taken captive. 3. Through the Messiah, Yahweh intervenes to rescue the survivors and deliver the captives. 4. The Gentile nations turn to their God, Yahweh, forever. And 5. The Messiah then rules from Jerusalem for 1,000 years. As we will see, the story told by Ezekiel is the same story told by every other prophet throughout the Bible. While using different symbolism and emphasizing different aspects of the story, all the prophets are pointing to these same series of events. This prophecy of Ezekiel should not be seen as a singular, narrow, and brief event, nor should this passage be viewed as containing a comprehensive description of all the details that this episode will bring with it. Rather, it is a very general, prophetic, poetic summarization of the final seven-year period leading up to the return of Jesus, as viewed from Ezekiel's particular perspective. The broad perspective of the passage is seen in that it begins with a description of God drawing Gog out to come against Israel, and it culminates with the return of the Messiah and the establishment of the Messianic kingdom. As a direct result of the destruction of Gog and his armies, the following things will occur. Number one, God's name will never again be blasphemed. Number two, Surviving nations will come to a saving knowledge of God. 3. The captives of Israel will be delivered. 4. God will pour out his spirit on Israel. 5. The survivors of Israel will come to know their God Yahweh forevermore. 6. Israel will dwell securely in their land forevermore. 7. God's Son, the Messiah, will reside in the land of Israel to rule on the throne of David. Because these are descriptions that can only be applied to the time of the return of Jesus and the establishment of his messianic kingdom, it's impossible that Gog and his armies are anything other than the Antichrist and his armies. This, then, will be our first order, to consider several timing texts which show that the passage concludes with the return of the Messiah and the establishment of his kingdom. Several times in the book of Daniel, we are told that throughout his career, the Antichrist will repeatedly blaspheme God's name. In Daniel chapter 11, verse 36, we are told that the Antichrist will exalt himself and speak astonishing things against the God of gods. In Daniel 7, 25, we are told that the Antichrist will blaspheme the Most High. But consider this fact, beyond being a blasphemer himself, the Antichrist will also gather a global following of those who no doubt will imitate his example. The global religious movement inspired and led by the Antichrist will be the greatest and most significant movement of blasphemy that the world has ever known. Yet in Ezekiel 38 and 39, we are told that after the defeat of Gog and his armies, God's name will never again be blasphemed. Ezekiel 39, starting in verse 27, it says, When I have brought them back from the peoples and gathered them out of their enemies' lands, I will show myself holy through them in the eyes of many nations. They will know that I am Yahweh their God, and that I caused them to go into captivity among the nations, and have gathered them to their own land. And I will leave none of them there any longer, nor will I hide my face from them any more, For I will pour out my spirit on the house of Israel, says the Lord Yahweh. The only way in which this passage can be reconciled with the greater context of end times prophecy is if we understand Gog to be the Antichrist. When Gog is destroyed along with his armies, only then will the mouths of the blasphemers forever be shut. 
Isaiah the prophet informs us that after the return of Jesus, the knowledge of God would fill the whole earth. Isaiah 11.9 it says, They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of God as the waters cover the sea. During Jesus' millennial reign, the Gentile nations will all worship the God of Israel. As mentioned in Psalms 22, verse 27, All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to Yahweh. All the families of the nations will bow down in your presence. For the kingship is Yahweh's, and he rules over the nations. Also, Isaiah 60, verse 14 says, The sons of those who afflicted you will come bending over to you. And all those who despised you will bow down at the soles of your feet, and they will call you the city of Yahweh, the Zion of the Holy One of Israel. In keeping with this theme found throughout the scriptures, we see that after God judges Gog and his armies, the nations come to know Yahweh, the God of Israel. Ezekiel 39 verse 6 says, I will send a fire on Magog and on those who dwell securely in the islands, and they will know that I am Yahweh. I will make known my holy name in the midst of my people Israel, and I will not allow my holy name to be profaned any more. The nations will know that I am Yahweh, the Holy One of Israel. The only way to do this passage justice is to view it as a reference to the nations actually coming to know and worship God, precisely as it is described by Isaiah when the whole earth is full of the knowledge, or more appropriately, the knowing of God. And this simply does not happen until after Jesus returns. Among the many terrible calamities that will befall the Jewish people during their coming subjugation by the Antichrist and his armies during the Great Tribulation is that many will be taken as captives and prisoners to the surrounding nations. God, through the prophet Amos, speaks of this day. It says in Amos 9.9, For behold, I will command and shake the house of Israel among all the nations as one shakes with a sieve, but no pebble shall fall to the earth. Jesus also spoke quite directly concerning the many Jewish captives who will be taken to the surrounding nations during the onslaught of the Antichrist in Luke 21 verse 24. It says, They will fall by the edge of the sword and be led captive among all nations, and Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. But while there are several passages that speak of this great calamity, Several others emphasize the deliverance of the captives by the hand of God through the Messiah. King David prophesied concerning the deliverance of the Jewish captives and the glorious days that would follow in Psalm 102. Psalm 102, starting at verse 13, it says, You will arise and have compassion on Zion, for it is time to show her favor, for the appointed time has come. For your servants take pleasure in her stones and have compassion on her dust. So the nations will fear the name of Yahweh. Yes, all the kings of the earth will fear your glory. For Yahweh has built up Zion. He has appeared in his glory. Down in verse 19 it says, For he has looked down from his holy height. From heaven Yahweh looked over the earth to hear the groaning of the prisoner, to free the children of death, that they may declare the name of Yahweh in Zion and his praise in Jerusalem. When the peoples are gathered together, Yes, the kingdoms to serve Yahweh. Isaiah also connected the deliverance of the Jewish captives to the day of Yahweh's vengeance in Isaiah chapter 61. 61 verse 1, The Spirit of the Lord Yahweh is upon me, because Yahweh has anointed me to preach good news to the humble. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and release to those who are bound to proclaim the year of Yahweh's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, and to provide for those who mourn in Zion by giving them a garland for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, so that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of Yahweh, so that he may be glorified. The prophet Zechariah connected the deliverance of the captives to the age of the Messiah's rule. In Zechariah chapter 9, 9 verse 10, he says, His rules shall be from sea to sea, and from river to the ends of the earth. As for you also, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will set your prisoners free from the waterless pit. Return to your stronghold, O prisoners of hope. I will restore to you double. 
Also, the prophet Joel speaks of the returning of the captives in Joel 3 1. It says, For behold, in those days and at that time, when I bring back the captives of Judah and Jerusalem. Zephaniah spoke similarly in Zephaniah chapter 2. He says, And the coastland will be for the remnant of the house of Judah. They will find pleasure on it in the houses of Ashkelon. Ashkelon is a coastal city in the southern district of Israel on the Mediterranean coast, 31 miles south of modern-day Tel Aviv and 8 miles north of the border with the Gaza Strip. It says, In the houses of Ashkelon they will lie down in the evening because Yahweh their God will visit them and restore their fortunes. So the Jews will be restored to these beautiful coastal areas in the future kingdom of God. So the prophets are very clear that the Jews would be restored as a people. The testimonies of all these prophets harmonize precisely with what Ezekiel describes will take place specifically as a result of the destruction of Gog and his armies. Ezekiel, the 39th chapter, starting in verse 25, says, Therefore this is what the Lord Yahweh says, Now I will bring back the captivity of Jacob and have mercy on the whole house of Israel and I will be jealous for my holy name. They will bear their shame and all their trespasses by which they have trespassed against me when they dwell securely in their land, and no one will make them afraid. When I have brought them back from the peoples and gathered them out of their enemies' lands, and I will show myself holy through them in the eyes of many nations, they will know that I am Yahweh, their God, in that I caused them to go into captivity among the nations and have gathered them to their own land. And I will leave none of them there any longer, nor will I hide my face from them any more, for I will pour out my spirit on the house of Israel, says the Lord Yahweh. A few points must be emphasized. First, the captives of Israel are delivered specifically as a direct result of the destruction of Gog and his armies. But this is not merely a general deliverance. Rather, the passage states that none of the captives will remain captive any longer. It is a complete and final deliverance that can only be associated with the Messianic age. By placing this event several years before the coming of the Antichrist, as some Christians believe, it becomes highly contradictory to many other passages which inform us that the armies of the Antichrist will take many Jewish people captive. The only way this portion of the prophecy can be reconciled with all other prophets is if Gog and the Antichrist are one and the same. Even as the Gentile nations will come to know and follow God during the Messianic kingdom, so also will the survivors from Israel come to know him. The theme of the remnant or the survivors of Israel all coming to know Yahweh after a mighty deliverance is a common theme throughout the prophets. Isaiah mentions this in Isaiah the 10th chapter. Joel speaks of it in Joel chapter 2, Micah and Micah chapter 4. Concerning this remnant, Jeremiah prophesied concerning the day when they would all come to know Yahweh. That's mentioned in Jeremiah the 31st chapter. Later, picking up on the prophets before him, the Apostle Paul speaks of the day when the surviving remnant of Israel come to a saving knowledge of God. And Paul speaks about this in Romans chapter 9 verse 27. It says, And Isaiah cries out concerning Israel, Though the number of the sons of Israel be as the sand of the sea, only a remnant of them will be saved. For the Lord will carry out his sentence upon the earth fully and without delay. But it is in Ezekiel where the two themes of the surviving remnant and their coming to know God are fully brought together. In this passage we are told that after Gog's armies are destroyed, All of surviving Israel will truly come to know him from that day forward. In Ezekiel 39 verse 22 where it says, So the house of Israel will know that I am Yahweh their God from that day and forward. It couldn't be any clearer. This is not merely a revival wherein many Jews become more devout. Rather the whole house of Israel comes to know Yahweh their God. This powerful national salvation was described in detail earlier in Ezekiel 20. In this passage, Yahweh connects the following essential details. Number one, Yahweh becomes king over Israel. Number two, Yahweh enters into judgment with Israel. Number three, Yahweh enters into an eternal covenant with Israel. Number four, the rebels are purged from Israel. 
Five, Yahweh removes the scattered Jews from among the nations. Number six, all of Israel comes to know their God. Consider the following passage, and as you do, ask yourself how this could be referring to anything other than the fullness of Israel's national salvation. Yet it is precisely what Ezekiel describes as taking place as a result of Gog and his armies being annihilated. So follow along here in Ezekiel 20, starting in verse 33. As I live, says the Lord Yahweh, surely with a mighty hand and with outstretched arm and with wrath poured out, I will be king over you. And with a mighty hand and with an outstretched arm and with wrath poured out, I will bring you out from the peoples and will gather you out of the countries in which you are scattered. And I will bring you into the wilderness of the peoples and there I will enter into judgment with you face to face, as I entered into judgment with your fathers in the wilderness of the land of Egypt. So I will enter into judgment with you, says the Lord Yahweh. I will make you pass under the shepherd's staff, and I will bring you into the bond of the covenant. And I will purge out from among you those who are rebelling and those who are transgressing against me. I will bring them forth out of the land where they live, but they will not enter into the land of Israel, and you will know that I am Yahweh. Verse 39, As for you, house of Israel, this is what the Lord Yahweh says, Go, serve everyone his idols, and afterwards also, if you will not listen to me, but my holy name you will no more profane with your gifts and with your idols. For on my holy mountain, on the highest mountain of Israel, says the Lord Yahweh, All the house of Israel, all of them, will serve me in the land there. I will accept them there, and I will require your offerings and the firstfruits of your offerings there with all your holy things. When I bring you out from the peoples and gather you out of the countries in which you have been scattered, I will accept you as a pleasant aroma, and I will show my holiness through you in the sight of the nations. You will know that I am Yahweh when I will bring you into the land of Israel into the country that I lifted up my hand and swore to give to your fathers. So as a result of Israel's repenting of their disobedience, God's pouring out of his spirit upon them and their coming to know him, Ezekiel also informs us that every last Jew will dwell securely in the land forevermore. In Ezekiel 39, 26-28, They shall forget their shame and all the treachery they have practiced against me when they dwell securely in their land with none to make them afraid. I will leave none of them remaining among the nations any more. Of this Bible passage, commentator C.F. Kyle says, From that time forth the people of God will no more have to fear a foe who can disturb its peace and its blessedness in the everlasting possession of the inheritance given to it by God. Even more forcefully, another well-known Bible commentator, Daniel Block, says, Ezekiel's declaration that not a single individual will be left behind when Yahweh restores his people is without parallel in the Old Testament. Yahweh's restoration is not only total, however, it is permanent. He promises never again to hide his face from his people. Of course, little needs to be said concerning the impossibility of Israel experiencing genuine security before the Antichrist is destroyed. After Jesus the Messiah is present, and after God has poured out his Spirit on all Israel. In one of the most powerful prophetic testimonies in Scripture, the prophet Zechariah speaks of a day when after destroying the nations that surround Jerusalem, Yahweh will pour out his Spirit on the surviving Jewish people. That's uh, found in Zechariah, the 12th chapter, starting in verse 9. It says, It will happen in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. And I will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplication. And they will look to me because of him whom they have pierced. And they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son. And will grieve bitterly for him as one grieves for his firstborn. In that day there will be a great mourning in Jerusalem. According to this passage, there are three events that coincide. Number one, God destroys the invading nations. Number two, the Jewish people come to recognize that Jesus, the one whom they have pierced, is in fact the Messiah. And three, God pours out his spirit upon the Jewish people. 
Isaiah the prophet described precisely the same day in Isaiah the 59th chapter, starting in verse 20. A Redeemer will come to Zion and to those in Jacob who turn from disobedience, says Yahweh. As for me, this is my covenant with them, says Yahweh. My spirit which is upon you and my words that I have put in your mouth will not depart out of your mouth, nor out of the mouth of your seed, nor out of the mouth of your seed's seed, says Yahweh, from henceforth and forever. So if the previous description in Ezekiel of Israel coming to know Yahweh from that day forward was not sufficient evidence to establish the conclusive nature of this event, then certainly Ezekiel's next description will seal its meaning. Ezekiel chapter 39 verse 28 They will know that I am Yahweh their God, and that I caused them to go into captivity among the nations, and have gathered them to their own land. And I will leave none of them there any longer, nor will I hide my face from them any more, for I will pour out my spirit on the house of Israel, says the Lord Yahweh. It is clear that this event involves far more than a glorified gospel tent revival sweeping through a town. Not only does God say that not a single Jew would be left among the nations, and all Israel would know him from that day forward, but he also says that he would pour his spirit out upon them and never again hide his face from them. In light of this undeniable evidence, most responsible commentators agree that this passage represents the final and complete turning of the Jewish people to their God forever when the Antichrist is destroyed. Notice the following well-known commentator's remarks about this event. Commentator Daniel Blox rightfully states, It marks the beginning of a new era which will be characterized by Israel's recognition of Yahweh, that is, the full realization of covenant relationship. Commentator C.F. Kyle says that this verse marks the turning point in Ezekiel's prophecy, wherein Israel will know that the Lord is and will always continue to be its God. Leslie C. Allen, in the Word Biblical Commentary, says, By the events of that day, the covenant relationship between them and Yahweh will be fully and finally endorsed. Robert W. Jensen, in the Brazos Theological Commentary on the Bible, says, Moreover, from that day forward, from the day when God openly demonstrates his power, also the house of Israel will acknowledge that I am their God. Hence this outcome of God's act is stated with special intensity, for the event that will compel this knowledge is the revelation of Yahweh himself. Israel, like the nations, will know God precisely as God. Ian McDuid in the NIV Application Commentary says that after Gog's destruction, This will bring about a radical change in the hearts of his people and in the security of his presence with them, such that he will never again hide his face from them. Matthew Henry, in speaking of this passage, says the indwelling of the Spirit is an infallible pledge of the continuance of God's favor. He will hide his face no more from those on whom he has poured out his Spirit. As the crowning proof that Gog is the Antichrist, Ezekiel reveals that at the conclusion of Gog's destruction, God's people will fill the very presence of God. And that's in Ezekiel 38, 19-20, where it says, For in my jealousy and in my blazing wrath I declare, On that day there shall be a great earthquake in the land of Israel, the fish of the sea and the birds of the heavens and the beasts of the field, all the creeping things that creep on the ground and all the people who are on the face of the earth shall quake at my presence. Because Jesus is acting as God's right arm of vengeance on that day, the entire world will know that it is Almighty God who is bringing this destruction upon them. Ezekiel 39.7 confirms that. It says, I will make known my holy name in the midst of my people Israel, I will not allow my holy name to be profaned any more, and the nations will know that I am Yahweh, the Holy One in Israel. But beyond all of the evidences that we have seen thus far, perhaps the clearest and most direct proof that Gog is the Antichrist is quite simply because God says so. First God says that Gog's invasion and subsequent destruction is the day that I have spoken of. You can find that in Ezekiel 39 verse 8. Behold, it comes, and it will be done, says the Lord Yahweh. This is the day about which I have spoken. Of course, the day that Yahweh is continually speaking of throughout the prophets, 
The day which is the focal point of all redemptive history is the day of the Lord. Then Yahweh informs Gog that he is the one that he has been speaking about throughout the prophets. This is mentioned in Ezekiel 38 verse 17. The Septuagint Bible words this passage not as a rhetorical question, but as a declaration, where it says, This is what the Lord Yahweh says. Are you he of whom I have spoken in old time by my servants, the prophets of Israel, who prophesied in those days for many years that I would bring you against them? While numerous prophetic passages written prior to Ezekiel reference an invader that would come against Israel in the last days, these are Antichrist passages set within the context of the day of the Lord. Once again, this verse is deeply problematic for those who argue that Gog is not the Antichrist or that Gog is from Russia. One can search and search, but throughout the prophets there is no pre-Ezekiel prophet who references a Russian invasion of Israel. I will be dealing with this subject of Russia in a later video. In summary, then, as a direct result of the destruction of Gog and his armies, the following things take place. 1. God's name will never again be blasphemed. 2. The surviving nations will come to a saving knowledge of God. 3. The captives of Israel will be delivered. 4. God will pour out his Spirit on Israel. 5. The survivors of Israel will come to know their God, Yahweh, forevermore. 6. Israel will dwell securely in their land forevermore. And beyond these things, Jesus the Messiah is present in the land of Israel. While many interpreters attempt to either separate these events from the destruction of Gog by several years, or to diminish their significance by claiming they do not refer to the age of the Messiah, no truly reasonable exegesis of this passage can arrive at such a position. It is abundantly clear that these things happened during the age of the Messiah and as a direct result of the destruction of Gog and his armies. Everything about the events and language in this passage indicate that this battle is not merely the opening act of the Great Tribulation, but rather it is the grand conclusion of that period. Okay, I'm going to end this video here. In the next video on Ezekiel, we will see more reasons why Gog has to be the Antichrist. And lastly, we will see how the book of Ezekiel actually tells us the specific Middle Eastern nations from where the Antichrist armies come from. So stay tuned for that, and thanks very much for watching.